OK, so we're going to talk about incredibly interesting stuff and incredibly important stuff. We already began discussing the Phillips curve and its implications. And the question that we were pondering at the end of last class was the following. It's 2001. You are the Turkish government. And you're the Turkish government that has inherited the following country. In 1995, you said we're doing some great stabilization programs. It ended up with a crisis. In 1998, you had another crisis. In 2000, you said this is the final and most well taught and the best um, structured program ever. We're going to decrease inflation once and for all. The inflation will cease to be a problem in this country. It's going to be great. You ended up with 100% inflation. Right? You had the 2001 crisis. Um, and now the questions are two. One is, so what are, the, what are the results of this? Does it matter that you have this past? Okay. So the question is, can you start every day anew and say, well, you know, uh, you're going to remember this. Yesterday was yesterday. Today is today. We had a prime minister who said this, right? Um, you know, we may have had crisis, bad things may have happened, but it's a new day now. So this time we have a great stabilization program. It's going to be different. Um, inflation will be low. Are these important? Okay, so do you have to worry that you told this to people a year ago and a huge calamity happened? Or could you just say, yeah, whatever, you know, it's all the same. Every day is a new day. We're going to start as if nothing has happened. You have to ask the questions from the agent's side. If you're an investor, a consumer, a worker, an employer, do you care that whenever the government told you this is a great stabilization program, this is a great disinflation program, okay, you ended up with a crisis and a actually higher inflation rate? Do you care? Why do you care? Very good. Why do you care? OK, so it tells you something about cyclical fluctuations. Right? Whenever the government tells you the economy will do great, it's a sign that it's going to do terrible. But why is that important? Let me ask the question better. Here's the question. Is there any reason why the government should care about what you believe in? That's a very good question. Okay. Does it matter for the government? Let's say the government is going to do the same thing anyway. Right? Does it matter whether you believe there is going to be disinflation or you think that inflation will actually be higher? Does it make a difference? Yes. Why? Because your expectations can actually cause a change in the inflation rate. Is this true? Yes. Yeah. Why? It affects our consumption. It affects your consumption. What else? We can think of this better, right? These are correct, but we want to think of the economic machinery, right? We have our Keynesian model. In that model, what does it change? Agri supply. How? Excellent. Because of future expectations, your wages will be shaped according to your inflation expectations. Okay? This is very, very important. It's not only the wage, it's all pricing. This model works over the wage, but those of you who will study economics you are going to learn this properly. It's going to boil down to the same idea. But the point is this whenever you are saying, I'm going to choose a price, that price could be a price of an actual good or a wage, a price of labor. Whenever you say, I'm going to choose a price that's going to be constant over the next several months, several quarters, perhaps a year, you have to worry about, well, what will the average price level be over that time period? What, will have, what, what, what kind of a relative price am I choosing? Because you know that what matters isn't the absolute price. Three, five, these aren't meaningful numbers. 
The question is, what is a relative price? Is this thing relatively cheap, relatively expensive? What is the price of labor in terms of milk? What is the price of the good that you're selling? Potato, in terms of bread. Those are the important things. The relative price depends on the price level. So you're asking yourself, what will the price level be? That's the inflation question. If you know that inflation on average will be 10% over the next year, and if you don't want your relative price to change, are you not going to change your price? No. It's a bad way of asking this, right? Are you not going to change your price? Um, and the answer is no, you will change your price. How much? 10%. Because 10% inflation means the, price, the average price will rise 10%, you don't want your relative price to change, you're going to change your price 10% as well. But when are you going to do this? You're choosing your price today, and you think that you won't be able to change it over the next year. Are you going to increase it 10% today? So you will at least adjust part ways, right? You could say, I'm going to do it 10% today, or you could say, I'm going to do 5% today and a 5% at the end of the year, or something like that, right? The question is whether you think you will be change your price again in six months, right? If it's a wage or a weight-like item, it could be your price. And I could tell you that, look, I will be your regular customer this year, but I want you to tell me a price and stick to that price throughout the year. Do we have this kind of agreements? Sure. You could change the price, but you would annoy me incredibly by doing that. Annoying your customer is not a good thing. Okay? So there are, there are costs of changing prices. And there is an incredibly wide array of theories that economists consider when thinking, why don't prices change every day? Because it's quite clear that prices don't change as fast as we think they would normally. Something is going on, okay? One of the theories is there are these implicit, unwritten contracts between buyers and sellers. People say, we're not going to change the price every day so that we will know what kind of a price we're, we're facing, right? <clears throat> if that's the world we're living in, then not only the wages, but many other prices are sticky. Do expectations matter when choosing your prices? Yes, they do. If expectations matter for you, when you're choosing your prices. Do your expectations matter for the policymakers? Yes. yes. This is why, let's write this down. Expectation management, Beklenti yönetimi. You hear this very often from central bankers. This is why this is a key concern for policymaking. We're able to talk about this. We want to formalize this idea a little bit more. The way of formalizing this is the Phillips curve. Effectively, what we're saying is the location of your Phillips curve depends on the expectations. Therefore, the inflation rate depends on your expectations. Thus, if the government has a way of changing your expectations, it can quite costlessly affect what inflation will be. Let's see how that works. This is your long-run Phillips curve, and this is your short-run Phillips curve. Whenever you see a social Phillips curve, you have to ask yourself, okay, this is a Phillips curve for a given level of expectations, expected inflation, right? We had this conversation before. Let's say this is 8% inflation. Okay, so this is reasonably meaningful for Turkey. So you have inflation that's stuck around 8%. You see 8%-ish inflation every year. And then this is, and also think that let me ask you, do you think Turkey is 
at its natural rate of unemployment now, as of today. What's the unemployment rate? 13. Is 13% unemployment normal unemployment for Turkey? OK. Too high, too low? Too high. So what you're telling me is 8% isn't here. 8% is here. Right? And this is 13% unemployment. Now, will we move back to the natural rate of unemployment? Yes. That's the definition of the natural rate. What will happen to inflation when we move back to the natural rate? Ah, so this says, look, if unemployment is going to fall, okay, that's going to mean an increase in inflation. So you're going to go to something like perhaps 10%. What's going on? Is this making sense? Well, I'm glad it makes sense. It makes sense to me too. Here's what's going on. This says, look, say this is your Nehru. The, rather, that's your Nehru. Okay, this is your U star. And this is the associated potential. Let's say we start from potential. What do you think the natural rate of unemployment for Turkey is? No one knows the answer, so just what do you think it is? So 13% unemployment is the unemployment we have today. What you're telling me is part of that is cyclical unemployment, which shouldn't be in the natural. Right? So that part of unemployment will go away. So unemployment will fall. Will it fall to 12%, 10%, 5%? What do you think the normal unemployment rate is? OK, let's say it's 10. So here we have 10% unemployment. 10%, mind you, is an incredibly high rate of unemployment. Many countries think that their neighbors are 5 or 6%. I agree with you. My, my, my feeling is also that Turkish national rate is higher than average, just because we have this mismatch between the labor force skills and the, and the production necessities. I don't know whether it's 10% or 9% or 8%, but it's an important question. <coughs> Let's say it's 10. So what you're telling me now is normally Turkey would have 10% unemployment and 10% inflation. But this year, somehow, we moved along this Phillips curve, so we ended up with 8% inflation, but 13% unemployment. We're going to move back. When we move back, unemployment will fall. Well, that's very good. But inflation will rise. That's very bad. Could we get the decrease in the unemployment without the associated increase in inflation? That's the good question. OK. So let's see whether that can be done or not. First, let's understand how this 10%, 10% business is possible. OK? At Y star, what is the unemployment rate? When we are at potential, what's the unemployment rate? That's 10%. Yes, it is 10%. Good. The potential is associated with the natural rate of unemployment. We know that normal unemployment isn't zero. In fact, you just told me that you think in Turkey normal unemployment is 10%, which is plausible. So at, if we are staying at this point all the time, unemployment is 10%. What's inflation? How can you have inflation when you're staying at a certain point? Is the price changing here? This says, OK, there's going to be 10% unemployment and zero inflation. It's going to be the same price level all the time. So something else is going on. What is going on? 
this is, so this is the essence of what we talked about on Monday. Okay, so let's talk about this again. In Turkey, do we normally see 10% inflation? So apparently, so for our example, let's say that's the case, okay? This is your long graph Phillips curve point. Normally, so what we are saying is, normally we would have 10% inflation, 10% unemployment, all right? If you think that inflation is going to be 10%, if inflation is on average 10%, do you think next year is going to be 10% as well? This is now your rational expectations question. Are you going to say, well, okay, you know, we're at a long run equilibrium, inflation will be zero, this is going to be a price level, or will you say, you know, for years and years and years, we had 10% inflation, somehow inflation is always 10%, and I think it's going to be 10% again this year. Which one? 10% inflation. If you expect 10% inflation, all right? Are you going to choose your wages and prices accordingly? Yes. yes. What happens here? Is it aggregate demand moving around, aggregate supply moving around? When producers change their pricing behavior and wage behavior? Aggregate supply shifts in. Okay, so now we have AS prime. What does the central bank do? Does the central bank want output to be here, below potential? This is almost an unwritten contract, right? Everybody is happy with this 10% inflation. So the central bank says, I'm gonna decrease interest rates, increase the money supply, you know, do whatever. Government as a whole, we're gonna pump up aggregate demand so that we end up here. What happened? What happened to unemployment? Unemployment is constant because output is constant, right? Nothing happened to unemployment. What happened to prices? That was easy. What's the inflation rate? That's your 10% inflation. Okay, so we ended up with 10% unemployment and 10% inflation. What's going to happen next year? Exactly the same thing. Aggregate supply shifts, aggregate demand shifts, aggregate supply shifts, aggregate demand shifts. So every year we see these shifts such that it seems like something is happening here, but this is all prices moving around. Okay? When you look here, you're at this constant point. It's the same unemployment rate, same inflation rate. Why, all, why do all these changes in this graph correspond to, a, correspond to a fixed point in this graph? This is an easy question. When I draw this graph, I'm drawing a whole bunch of shifting lines, right? There are a lot of changes here. Okay? When I look at this graph, what I'm telling you is all of those changes in that graph are summarized by this one point. This one point says you're always at 10% unemployment and 10% inflation. Right? To say the same thing here, I have to say I'm always at this point and these curves are shifting every year. So why is it that all these changes in this graph correspond to that one point in that graph? No. Yeah, it is the natural rate, but that's not the answer. Really, really, really easy question. Just ask yourself, what are on the axis? What is changing here? The price. So I have the price on this axis, so this thing has to be changing. What do, what do I have here? Inflation. What is inflation? It's a price change. I already have the change on the axis. Is the change changing? Is the change in the price level different here? Or is it the same change every year? You couldn't tell by the way I draw this, but the idea is these are the same change every year. If it's the same change every year, is it the same inflation? Yes. It's the same point. That was easy. Cool. Then what happens? Then once again, say this year, we think that it's going to be 10% inflation. Aggressive supply goes here, okay? Then you end up with a crisis. A crisis means people don't want to spend 
don't want to invest, things are bad, right? We don't want to do business. Is aggregate demand going to increase as much? Let's say the central bank does its usual thing, okay? Is your consumption behavior the same? No. Is your investment behavior the same? No. What happens to aggregate demand? Does it still increase? Yes, but? Not as much. Ah, so then you end up here. Let's call this AD crisis. Okay? Now we're here. What happened? What happened to output? Did output decrease in 2009? Yes. Yeah. Bana aptal muamelesi yapmayın. Hani bu, özellikle sizin bu, evet cevaplarınız yani hani <gülüyor> Output did decrease. How much? What was the change in real GDP in 2009? Şimdi ben size bakacağım öyle. Somebody just mumbled the right answer. Something like that, 4.6%. Okay, so your real GDP decreased quite a bit. What happened, okay, so here we see that. If you're below the potential, are you also going, are you going to be at the natural rate of unemployment? More, inf more unemployment or less unemployment? Very good. What happened to prices? Did they increase? Yes, did they increase as much as usual? Is inflation again 10%? Right? This would be 10%, this is something less than that. So apparently, we move to a point like this. More unemployment, less inflation. Did we see a lower rate of inflation last year? Lower than 2008. Yes, we did. Okay? We had a very low rate of, infl we have a very low rate of inflation for our standards. Okay? It wasn't 8, it was actually much below that. But the whole idea here is that, indeed, we saw this inflation falls, unemployment increases effect, okay? So now, we're at this point. What will happen? We are at this point. What will happen? Do you think next year inflation will be 10%? Yes. yes. Okay, that didn't change. You said, okay, this was a one-time, you know, mistake in our expectations. There was this crisis that nobody saw coming. Whatever. So, we turned out to be wrong in our expectations, but next year it's going to be 10% inflation. Will the central bank deliver on that? Will the, cent will the central... So, can we, also, can we once again have this? This goes up. This goes up. Let's say this is 10% again, okay, so this distance. So we have 10% inflation back to natural rate of unemployment. However, that means your inflation will go up from 8% to 10%. Does the central bank want that? Or does the central bank want to say, well, you know, now that we've found 8% inflation, let's stay here. Wouldn't that be better? Well, it would be better only if you can have 8% inflation with 10% unemployment. It isn't very good if you have to live with 13% unemployment for a long time. So what could the central bank do? I'm going to erase this. I'm going to keep that. I'm going to erase this so that I can draw the same thing again. All right? What could the central bank do? So now we're here, okay? Now we're here. We had 8% inflation, 13% unemployment. The central bank says, I want to stay at 8%. It's going to come to that. Let's see. 
So you expect 10% inflation, let's begin with that. Let's say you expect 10% inflation this year. But the central bank suddenly realized that, you know what, 8% inflation is possible and I really like this, so I'm going to cause 8% inflation. Can they do this? You expected 10% inflation, so aggregate supply is here. The central bank said, well, I'm going to deliver 8% inflation. Is aggregate demand going to shift all the way to here? Or to here? Or to here? Right, the central bank is doing monetary policy so that it's moving aggregate demand around. Right? Should the central bank increase aggregate demand a little or a lot to have less inflation than usual? A little. So the central bank is going to do this. Right? What happened? Do we again have 8% inflation? I hope. I mean, so the, the idea is this would be 10%. And let's say this is 8%, okay? I could, in fact, do this slightly better. Let's do it this way. Okay, so this is 8% inflation. What happened here now? The central bank essentially kept us at this point, rather than moving back here, right? We again have 8% inflation, but that 8% inflation comes at the cost of keeping unemployment at 13%. What happens the year after? Do you still expect 10% inflation? No, that's very important, right? Once the central bank delivers you a certain rate of inflation for several years, you learn, and you learn both ways. If inflation turned out to be 50% for five years, you would begin to expect 50% inflation, okay? But if inflation is low for several years, you begin to expect low inflation. So the year after, do you expect 10%, 9%, or 8%? In general, you don't have these discrete jumps. People don't go from expecting 10% to 5%. Even if they see 5% for a few years. They first think that, you know, perhaps it's going to be 10%, perhaps it's going to be 5%. It's going to be somewhere in between 8%-ish, maybe. Right? It's a slow process. Your expectations don't change that fast, unless something drastic happens. Okay, so people expect, that rather than 10%, this year they expect 9%. If they expect 9%, this is going to be what happens. The central bank is going to deliver this. I should do this better so we come to an equilibrium point. That's slightly closer to potential. Why is that? Because expected inflation and realized inflation are now closer to each other. Right? You expected 9%, you ended up with 8%, so you should be somewhere close to potential. What happened? We moved here. Okay, ah, uh, this isn't right. This isn't right, my apologies. The whole point is, this is actually very wrong, shame on me. <clears throat> if you expect 9% inflation, okay, are we still looking at this Phillips curve? This was your Phillips curve based on your 10% expected inflation. If you now think inflation will be 9%, is this still the same Phillips curve that we're it will shift, up or down? Down. Okay, so now we're going to have this. Let's call this, this is, this is expected 10% inflation Phillips curve. This is expected 9% inflation Phillips curve. Okay, so now we're here. How do I know? Well, I ended up with 8% inflation again. I expect a 9%, so unemployment is lower. That's very good. Okay. You end up with 8% again. Now do you expect 8% inflation? Eventually, at some point, right? So you spend several years at this 8%, 13% point, and then you say, you know, apparently it's not going to be 10% forever. I shouldn't expect 10%. You say, I'm going to expect 9%. That seems to be more reasonable. When you're expecting 9%, why does the Phillips curve shift down? Yes, but why does the change in expectations change the location of the Phillips curve? That's the, you understand that this is correct. You feel this, but you should be able to say it. 
That's right. A slightly better way of saying this is the following. Look. If you expected 10% inflation, okay, let's say you start from an agro supply curve that looks like this. If you expected 10% inflation, you would be looking at an agro supply curve that's here. Okay? And then the actual inflation rate and the unemployment rate would depend on whether agro demand is here or here or here or here. Right? Your Phillips curve would trace effectively this agro supply curve. Okay? If you expect 9% inflation, is agro supply here? You start from here, okay? You say, I'm, I think inflation will be 10%, so I'm going to choose my prices, my wages accordingly. Agro supply shifts here. That's what this Phillips curve depicts. This Phillips curve depicts. Okay? Okay? This is an important okay, right? It's, it's extremely important that you understand the Location and the slope of the Phillips curve depends on the location and the slope of the agri supply curve, right? We'll talk about this once again. What does the location of the agri supply curve depend on? Your expected inflation. That's why the Phillips curve also depends on your expected inflation. If instead of expecting 10% inflation, so that agri supply would be here, you expected 9% inflation. Would the agrarian supply still shift from here to here? No. no. Would it not shift at all? No. Yes. Okay, so I shouldn't ask these negative questions. Would the, would the agrarian supply curve shift, this short range supply curve shift, if you expected 9% inflation rather than 10% inflation? Yes. yes, it would. Would it shift to this point again? No. no. Less than that. Ha! So you're saying, look, with 9% expected inflation, agrarian supply would shift here. Then each movement in the aggregate demand curve and each inflation rate from here, right, you started from this price level, each inflation rate corresponds to a higher output level. Right. You're looking at an agri supply curve that's farther out. So each price level corresponds to a higher output level. Does this make sense? This is a particularly ugly graph. Let's do this again. Look. The agri supply agri demand analysis itself is very easy. Okay? Thinking about the Phillips curve is also very easy. You've been nodding, and in, fa in fact, you've been nodding with understanding faces for the past hour or so. Right? But making the link between the two is what's crucial. And that's, that's not so easy. So let's do this again. We said, We have a certain agrarian supply curve. Agrarian supply begins from here. Okay? It's going to either shift to AS, let's say, A or ASB. A is expected 10% inflation. B is expected 9% inflation. We agreed that if you expect lower inflation, agrarian supply is going to shift left, shift less. Now what I'm telling you is, if it shifts less, then any given level of, you start from this price level, right? This, this is your price level. My artwork is really terrible. But you do understand the point here. This is your price level. You start from here. Now, Compared to 10% inflation expectations, if you have 9% inflation expectations, if I tell you that the, the new price is here, okay? So I'm telling you a given level of inflation. Inflation was whatever. Which aggregate supply curve gives you more output? B. That was easy. Is it going to give you more output at each price level? Yes, that's what shifting this supply curve means. 
If it's going to give you more output at each price level, does it also imply that for each inflation rate, there's going to be more output if you expect less inflation? With B, with each inflation rate, you end up with more output, right? Asking you. Yeah, I could ask you too, yes. Do you agree with this? Good. Do you understand it and agree with it, or do you just agree with it because I'm saying it? Very good. If the output level is higher at each inflation rate, if you expect a lower inflation, is unemployment lower? That means your Phillips curve has shifted down. At each inflation rate, now you're looking at a lower unemployment rate. Okay? That's why your expectations shift. That's why changes in expectations shift your Phillips curve. Okay? This is a really important okay. This is the point where everything we've learned so far in the semester comes together. All of your aggregate demand, aggregate supply, right? Everything about, you know, why is aggregate supply upward sloping in the short run? Because that's the answer to why is the Phillips curve downward sloping in the short run? Why do expectations matter? How does central bank change the demand curve? All of them culminate in this. So now we're saying, finally you said, we expect 9% inflation. That immediately meant, ooh, your Phillips curve shifted down. That's great. When you end up with 8% inflation again, rather than having 13% unemployment, now you have 11% unemployment. That's also great. At some point, will you begin to expect 8% unemployment, 8% uh, inflation? For five years, you see 8% inflation. Will you say, apparently, this is a new world where Turkey normally has 8% inflation? Do you say this? Yes. Do you choose your prices and wages accordingly? Yes. Sure. Your behavior and your expectations are consistent with each other. What happens here? Very good. So your Phillips curve now shifts here. You ended up with 8% inflation and 10% unemployment. Good. Now, was this a happy five years for this country? Really? You ended up with, you know, on average, unemployment for five years was higher than normal. Was this a happy five years? Here's the question. Why do countries ever live with high inflation? You're Turkish. So this question must have occurred to you. How come from mid-1970s on, this country had high inflation? How come throughout 1990s we had you know, 50, 60, 90% inflation every single year? Why not just say, okay, we're not going to do this anymore this year. We're not going to print money. We're not going to decrease interest rates. We're not going to pump up aggregate demand. Inflation was 90% last year, but we're going to go for 3% inflation this year. Could you do it? Well, I mean, you can. Ah, what would happen to unemployment if you did that? It would go to like 47%. Okay? So this is, this is a great point. Now you understand. Let's say inflation was 90% last year. Okay? Now we're asking a different question. So this is why many countries, including Turkey, chose to live with high inflation. Okay? This is partly because we were stupid, and we really were stupid. Right? If you're a stupid enough government that doesn't collect taxes but does a lot of expenditure, you have to print money to finance yourself. That leads to inflation. Right? And you do this for a decade, people learn to expect this. You do this for two decades, entire generations grow up knowing not, nothing other than high inflation. <coughs> what I want you to think of is the following. Let's say we again were here. And then something happened, we shifted down here. This is 2009, okay? Now we're in 2010. We're, we're around this point now. And the central bank says, I want to, this is actually what they are saying, right? I don't want the inflation to go back to a higher level. 
So I want inflation to stay around here. But I don't want to cause high inflation, uh, high unemployment. Can I do this? Take five minutes to think about this. Come back, we'll talk about that.